Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up. Our guest today is Helen Thorpe, and she's here today to talk to us about her new book, The Newcomers, Finding Refuge, Friendship, and Hope in an American Classroom. Now, Helen is an award-winning journalist who lives in Denver, Colorado, and her journalism has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, Texas Monthly, and 5280 Magazine. Her first book, Just Like Us, The True Story of Four Mexican Girls Coming of Age in America, won the Colorado Book Award and was named one of the best books of the year by the Washington Post. The Denver Center for the Performing Arts adapted this nonfiction book for the stage as a play. Helen's second book, Soldier Girls, The Battle of Three Women at Home and at War, was named Time Magazine's number one nonfiction book of the year. The Boston Globe called it utterly absorbing, gorgeously written, and unforgettable. So you can see why I am so delighted to be introducing Helen to the show to talk about her new book, The Newcomers. So let's welcome to the show, Helen. Thank you so much for having me on. It is such a pleasure to have you here and to be able to talk about your new book, and it's making such big waves. Thank you. Um, It was an incredible experience to get to work on this book, and I loved every second of it. So I'm glad it's connecting with readers for sure. I have so many questions for you. I guess we'll just start from the beginning. What inspired you to write this book, Helen? Sure. Well, um, I'm a lifelong journalist, and and at various times in my career, I've been drawn to this same subject of immigrants, or in this case, you know, mostly refugees. Um, I think the the reason that I keep coming back to this topic and that it's one of my favorite things to write about has a lot to do with the fact that my parents are Irish. They were born in Ireland, both of them. My dad grew up in Dublin. My mom grew up on a dairy farm in rural Ireland. Um, And they separately immigrated first to England where they met and got married and had me. And then they immigrated to this country and brought me here when I was a baby. So I, I grew up with a green card and grew up, you know, visiting my grandparents and my cousins and aunts and uncles in Ireland every summer or every other summer, whenever my parents could afford to take us back there. So having that kind of background, I think, has just made me really interested in stories of transition and people changing countries and kind of the strength and resilience it takes to to start over in a new place Um And that's what my first book was about, and that's what I've returned to now in my third book again. Yeah, because we know that you've done several other works, you know, Soldier Girls and and, uh, Just Like Us. And so it's, I always find it so fascinating what compels an author to look at a certain topic with such passion like you have. And that makes such perfect sense. And I think a lot of people can relate to that because, you know, you know, when you come from immigrants and, you know, just about everyone I know has, you know, my great grandparents came over from Portugal and they had, they arrived in Hawaii. So you, you kind of look at these transitions and they tell you stories and you hear how life is. And so it's a, it was a, a, a different time, but it, it's just interesting. They go through different struggles and some people who maybe have been here for generations. Absolutely. And um, I guess, you know, not wearing my journalist hat, but my mom hat, Mm -hmm. when I am raising my son, I feel it's something I really want to hand on to him are those stories of what my parents went through and what life was like for them back in Ireland. Needless to say, you know, the experiences my parents had were a lot easier than some of the kids that I've written about. Um, So, you know, my parents came here as adults, but they were already speaking English because that's the main language in Ireland. So they never had to like start all over learning a new language, which I think is incredibly tough. Um, Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I kind of want my son not to take his life here for granted. And I want him to know, 
you know, that things were harder on the farm when my mom was growing up there. She, when I was little, um, instead of reading to us, she always told us stories and, and the favorite stories we would demand to hear over and over again were about like her growing up on the farm. And, um, you know, they just, she would tell us all kinds of stories about how thrifty they had to be and how little money they had and how they made everything last. And um, she was one of 10 kids and her father would loan her out, loan each of his kids out to other relatives who didn't have so many kids or didn't have any kids at all. And they would go live on other farms for sometimes like years at a time so that they could do chores and things like that. It was just a very different, kind of upbringing than the one I had in suburban New Jersey. And she wanted me to know that. And by extension, I sort of want to pass that on to my son. And just have that education. Because, I mean, in the U.S., we we have things, things are a little bit easier for most people, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's not that there's not hardship here. Of course there is. But some of the kids that I was writing about in my new book were coming from places where they had never in their whole lives taken a hot shower and, um, you know, hadn't always had a roof over their head. And the the extreme hardship that is more common in other countries was something that I was hoping I could help more people be aware of. Mm-hmm. Well, and so when you started to do your research for your latest book, The Newcomers, what um, was the kind of the main inspiration to work with um, children in school? Well, I wasn't certain that that's what I was going to do, and I was sort of running around town. I had been reading stories about refugees. I'd been clipping those stories for a long time. I was trying to figure out if there was something I could contribute that would be new or different. And I was just speaking to different people who are working with refugees a lot. I met with people at refugee resettlement agencies and nonprofits serving refugees. And at a certain point, an education reporter at Chalkbeat, um, which is an education website and newsletter for teachers and anybody interested in schools, um, a reporter there said, well, have you been to South High School? And in Denver, South is a place in our school system where kids are designated to, to go if they want support services geared towards students who speak foreign languages other than Spanish Mm -hmm. and any student whose schooling has been interrupted. And the the typical reason that students' schooling is interrupted for for years at a time or months at a time is generally war if if they're coming from other countries. And so um, I went to South, and the principal there said, oh, I read your first book about undocumented students, and you would be welcome to spend as much time as you want inside our school. And I had never had, um, you know, an authority figure hand me that kind of access before. As a, as a journalist, you're not typically just welcomed into an institution like that. You know, you're battling for access, if anything. Um, so it was a really rare opportunity um, being invited to spend a year inside a school. And that's what I did. I chose a very beginner level English language acquisition classroom. And I found it totally fascinating to watch how a teacher would teach English to 22 kids who spoke 14 different languages and arrived using five different alphabets. It was just extraordinary to see. Well, I could imagine just how you know, fascinating it is to have that kind of access, my goodness, and to be able to develop things the way you did. Yeah. It also, for me, raised just, I had to uh, think really hard about how to be a good person and how to be an ethical journalist in those um, circumstances, because I was in a room with kids who um, I couldn't walk up to them and say, hi, I'm a journalist when we first met and have them understand me. So how would I even explain to them that a journalist was in their room? How would I ask them if they wanted to participate in the book and have them know what I was saying? You know, I I was really puzzling over some of that stuff at the outset of the project and ultimately wound up hiring 14 different interpreters to meet with the kids in each of their home languages to let them know who I was and 
sending letters home to their parents in their home languages. Um, working, I had to work really hard to, to make sure that the kids who were talking to me wanted to participate in the book and understood the, the, the circumstances. And then amazingly, 21 of the 22 kids wanted to meet with me and share their stories in a kind of a one-on-one setting and agreed to participate in the book. So that was extraordinary. And um, just getting a chance to know these kids for me was transforming. I can imagine. Now, what I, I know that you sent letters out. What was the selection process with each of these children? So the way that I wanted to write about this in the book, I, I wrote about spending a year inside this classroom, described who the teacher was, what inspired him, why he wanted to work with these students, show how he taught English over the course of a year um, in ways that would be fun and funny and entertaining for a reader. Um, it, you know, it's not, it's not the, the book that I was aiming to write would be for just a general reader interested in amazing life stories. Not, mm-hmm. It's not geared at, like, um, you know, only English as a second language teacher. or, or It's not for a specialized audience. Um, it's really kind of celebrating the life journeys mm-hmm. represented in the room. And um, uh, f- from being inside the classroom then and, and, and writing about what the year was like, I, th- I felt um, a lot of curiosity about, well, who is raising these amazing kids? You know, there were two kids in the room, Solomon and Methuselah, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the country that has sent the most refugees to the U.S. in recent years. Mm-hmm. And they showed up and they just hit the ground running. They were learning so much English that in the subsequent school year, they went into mainstream classes and started reading To Kill a Mockingbird. And I just didn't even understand at the outset that it was possible for kids to absorb a new language so quickly. Like, how were they doing this? And who was raising these marvelous boys? Um, mm-hmm. So uh, when I met with Solomon and Methuselah, they told me a little bit about what life in the Congo had been like. And right away, I asked if I could meet their parents. Um Life there for them had been extraordinarily difficult. They were living in a zone with a lot of conflict. And I didn't want to ask the boys about traumatic things during their school day. So by asking to meet their parents, I was basically hoping that the adults in the family could tell me the story of their journey here, why they had to leave the Congo or what they survived instead of asking, you know, school-aged kids So they did invite me home, and I spent many, many, many visits with their family, getting to know their parents and their siblings, and ultimately traveled to the Congo and met relatives there. And you got a much deeper understanding of why the Congo is sending so many refugees there. Um, So I tried to branch out from the classroom into a few homes, and I I chose – to focus on families representing countries that were sending the most refugees to the U.S. and also families whose stories were dramatic in some way and therefore really interesting. Um, So another family that I focused on was an Iraqi family. Iraq does also send a lot of refugees to the U.S. And and generally speaking, Iraqi refugees coming here had to leave Iraq because – they worked with the U.S. military when we invaded that country, and then life became unsafe for them. So that was the story of Jacqueline and Mariam, two sisters in Eddie Williams' classroom. And those two sisters, when they invited me home, I met their mom, and she was struggling to make it here as a single mom because they had lost their father. You know, their mom had lost her husband uh, during the Iraq War, and um that's also kind of a hallmark refugee story from Iraq. Many single moms with with kids struggling to make it as the sole breadwinner under really that's really really tough circumstances. Um, so I admire their mom a lot. I thought she had a lot of grit, a really tough, strong woman. Uh, and, and so those were some of the family stories that I wanted to share in addition to to writing about the time inside the classroom. 
Yeah, you would have to be a very strong person to go through all the things you go through, immigrate to another country, and set you know, and just you know, you don't look, know the language. You're setting up, you know, as far as um, a place to live and work and all that, having your kids educated. So it, it's got to be very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, and just to go through the vetting process that refugees go through. So their mother, um, when she was applying, so they they had originally fled from Iraq, but and they went to what they thought was going to be a safe country. They fled to Syria. But then after they arrived in Syria, that country fell into civil war, and they were living in Damascus, and they saw some terrible things. There were horrible car bombings in their neighborhood, and they had to flee yet again. So they were double refugees, and they fled from Syria to Turkey. And then in Turkey, their mom, um, you know, just to go through the vetting process. So when the United Nations designates someone an official refugee, the United States then has five federal agencies involved in the vetting of that person's background to make sure that it's safe to admit that refugee and that they are, we know exactly who they are and that they're coming here with no ill intent and will um, both, you know, succeed in their transition here, but also be a good citizen of the United States. And the vetting process is really lengthy. So their mom had to make multiple trips from the small um, city where they were living to major cities um, in Turkey where the, the U.S. officials were, were waiting to vet them. And, you know, the bus ride, in, in one case was 10 hours long. She had to take that trip with all three of her kids multiple times to do the security background checks and the medical background checks. And it took a lot of strength for her just getting through that very lengthy vetting process, given the distances she had to travel, being a single mom, having three kids, taking all three kids on these long bus rides. So it, it, um, uh, I don't think the refugee stories today are very well understood. I'm not sure the media and, um, you know, the political discussion has been as in-depth as it could be. And I think when we understand better who refugees are, um, my admiration for them just grew exponentially over time as I spent time with these families. And I also came to appreciate better that we're actually – as a country, very good at refugee resettlement. And that um, resettlement process is something that we have a lot of practice at and that we do very, very well. Uh, It's something our country has been founded on, you know, as as, um, being refugees, basically, from um, or immigrants from one place to another. And and it's um, nice to know that they – there's still this openness with that, even though there's, like you're saying, it's not in the media as much. I think if if people understood what the vetting process entailed, I mean, to go through and not just the travel, but having to pay to, to get there, all these things, it, it comes at great cost for people who, you know, a lot of times don't have anything. Yeah. Generally speaking, refugees are given a a loan to cover their airfare, but then once they arrive here, they start paying that back in tiny increments over a really long period of time so that they themselves incur the cost of the airfare. They can't afford it at the outset, so it's loaned to them, but then they pay it back over time. And I've I've not seen that really, you know, described or, or well understood. The other thing that's not really well understood that I think is a big misconception is um, our our vetting process has been so solid and and so secure that we've actually, you know, the Department of Homeland Security, which runs this process, has never made a mistake. They've gotten it right 100% of the time. There's not one instance of somebody with official refugee designation showing up in the U.S. and doing anything like a a lethal act of terror or the kinds of things that you see, you know, um, the media focus on sometimes uh, happening. Um, The the instances of terror that 
the media has focused on and that people in politics talk about a lot, sometimes they're discussing um, things that happened in Europe. And in that case, there were a lot of people leaving the Middle East, sort of walking to Europe, not being part of an official refugee pipeline, not part of any official vetting process, just showing up without documents, without legal status. And the situation in Europe with these asylum seekers is a little bit more like our situation with undocumented immigrants coming um, from Central America, Mexico, countries to the south of us. Um, But our refugee pipeline has actually been extremely secure and well vetted. And the discussion in the media would make you think otherwise. There's a, a great misunderstanding here. I think there's a big conflation of different terms. Like when, when somebody um, in the federal government or at the United Nations says refugee, they're talking about a person with official status in the eyes of the UN and in the eyes of the Department of Homeland Security who's, who's gone through a very secure process. But you wouldn't know that given the kind of political dialogue we're having right now. And I wish that could be um, fixed. I think we're not doing a very good job in our discussion right this second. Well, I think your book helps to get that conversation started for a lot of people that don't have any idea what that all entails. I mean, I didn't until I got a hold of your book. And so it's interesting to kind of just see some of the things that um, – that are not quite as well explained as maybe they should yeah. be. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I do think we could have a much deeper conversation as a country. And I, that's my wish that this book could become part of, become part of fostering that better dialogue. I think I, I really feel that it can, because it gives such a human, you know, the way you're such an eloquent writer and it gives such a human aspect to it where we see what, what these different families, you know, ha- have experienced. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a journey for sure just to see how it is that they, you know, come from these countries that have been through such horrible war states and then have the courage to travel and make it here. Yeah. Yeah, it takes tremendous strength and bravery and resilience to, to, to make it through that process. And then once here, you know, to take advantage of the opportunity that's been given. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the other thing that I was really struck by when I was getting to know these families was watching them become economically self-sufficient so quickly. A refugee family is given a one-time cash stipend when they arrive, it's about $1,000 per person, and that goes to cover rent and groceries, but that money's gone in basically two to three months. Mm-hmm. And then the person is expected by the refugee resettlement agency to have a job and be economically self-sufficient. So families are given essentially 90 days um, from when they land in a U.S. airport to being economically self-sufficient. And to watch families succeed at doing that, I, I couldn't get over it. I just thought it was an extraordinary thing to see. It's got to be very difficult when we talk about, you know, there's a, a language barrier in many cases, and yet, you know, it's not slowing them down to get jobs and, and move ahead. Yeah, they wind up doing very menial kinds of jobs because that's the kind of work you can do if your English is non-existent or not very good. Mm-hmm. So you see the parents of the students in the classroom that I spent the year inside, you see their parents working places like meat packing plants, doing janitorial work in hotels or other kinds of businesses, um, working as maids, um, working factory jobs, you know, work, work where you don't have to interact with clients or customers, but uh, you can do the job even if your English is limited and they're working really, really hard, uh, T- tough work, long hours. Yeah, to make it. But they're grateful. Yeah, to make ends meet. But they're but they're grateful to have a job, and that sort of shown through loud and and clear um, the the gratitude on the part of the parents just to have any job at all. Yeah, and and just to be in a situation where they feel safe. 
you know. Exactly, to have a safe home for their kids, yeah. Yeah. Well, would it, you know, so that I understand kind of more of what the integration for the parents are like. For the children, what is it like for being a student and integrating? Yeah. You know, I think the dominant emotion that all the students felt, the one that they shared um, at the outset of the year was loneliness because they arrived in this classroom and they couldn't talk to each other. They couldn't make friends or it was, it was extremely difficult to make friends because they couldn't communicate successfully. Um, pretty quickly, I mean, this was the amazing and really fun part of this project was watching these teenagers be teenagers nonetheless. And, you know, teenagers are very social animals. They really want to connect with one another. <laughs> yeah. They want to, you know, have sleepovers and flirt or fight or interact and, um, and above all, make friends. So I was watching students figure out that they could get the Google Translate app and, and translate from their home language into the home language of whatever student was sitting next to them that they wanted to befriend. And I'll never forget, you know, seeing one girl from Vietnam translating Vietnamese into Spanish and sending a text message that way through Google Translate app to a girl from El Salvador and the two of them going back and forth. And, of course, what they were talking about was Converse high tops. (laughs) (laughs) Like, they're just teenagers in the end. And um, Mm -hmm. I loved... Uh, watching these, you know, their personalities emerge as they figured out how to communicate with one another. And um, the, the, the classroom itself transformed from scared and overwhelmed and lonely at the outset of the year to, by the end of the year, this joy-filled place as the kids, you know, had basic English and could communicate. And, you know, a boy from El Salvador proposed to a girl from Iraq in math class uh, because he finally had enough English to communicate with her that he had a crush on her. And, you know, he (laughs) drew a a blue ink ring on her finger and a blue ink ring on his finger. And just watching the kids um, be able to have interactions like that once they had enough English, uh, a shared common language at last to to communicate with one another. really filled my days with joy and I found this project very uplifting and I don't I think that was a surprise to me because you know the refugee stories that you see in the in the media the press tends to focus on the darkest moment or the biggest problem the families have and I think in our coverage we have missed the fact that after a refugee family arrives here and gets a chance to resettle the the emotions become much more positive. They're turning a corner and they are, you know, filled with gratitude. The kids are experiencing joy when they can make friends at school and live in a safe place. Um, so the, the classroom that I was following just kind of the kids blossomed and the room itself came to life in a way that made me want to celebrate what had been happening inside that room. Oh, I can I can definitely feel that. Now, is the Google Translate app is that something that the teachers in these classrooms are sharing with the students so that they know that they can communicate a little bit better or communicate with one another? Yes. Yeah, so um, obviously, like the whole use of electronic devices in classrooms can get controversial or problematic, and certainly there were kids in this classroom that would use their phones to socialize instead of to work, and the teacher had to always be monitoring that. But he did let them, um, if they had a cell phone, he did let the students use the phone for translation purposes. And he would, he had a rule that you were supposed to raise your hand and ask, may I use my phone for translation? And he even like wrote that sentence out on the whiteboard. And the kids were supposed to ask permission and supposed to be using the phones to translate you know, their homework or their studies for that day. But because they're teenagers, they're immediately trying to text one another or, you know, text the boy upstairs and and all that. And their teacher acknowledged to me at a certain point that he let some of that socializing happen because 
that's when they're most motivated to use their newfound English and communicate with one another or, you know, to, to figure out ways of translating from their home language into a language somebody else can understand. So he kind of wanted to use their desire to socialize um, to help foster their learning. And he thought that at least half of the English they ultimately acquired, they picked up in these informal interactions with each other. You know, he would teach them half half of their uh, new, newly acquired English, but the rest of it they were going to pick up from one another. So he he allowed them to socialize a little bit, and then he sort of, you know, always still was was attempting to keep order in the room and, and monitor the use of the phones at the same time. <laughs> It sounds like a full-time job right there. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well, and I think that's just fascinating how, you know, technology has gotten to the point where it can help with things like this. It can help, you know, children understand one another, you know, and make it a little bit easier for, for them to communicate and not feel so isolated. Exactly. Exactly. It was amazing for me to, to learn about Google Translate and um, see all the languages, and I began using it. But partway through the year, I realized that, of course, there are some languages that are not on Google Translate yet uh, because they're not used by that many people. And so some of the students from Burma in particular who showed up and were ethnic minorities from that country, and they their language you know, isn't used by as many people worldwide and um, because their languages weren't on Google Translate, those kids were a little more isolated and a little more lonely until they got English and then they, you know, quickly branched out socially. Uh, But it was really fascinating watching the kids and the new technology and the interface between the kids and the technology. That's a great age we live in, I swear. Yeah. it's, It's just amazing to see that happen. Well, and with... All the students that were part of your book, had each of them encountered war at some point? So out of the 22 students that were in this classroom, um, about two-thirds of them had official refugee status. So, um, So many of the kids in the room had come from war zones or places with active conflict, uh, such as the Congo, Burma, Iraq, Eritrea, and other places. But in addition, there were also students who arrived either because their family was lucky and won a green card in a lottery, mm-hmm. or um, uh, there were two students from El Salvador, both of them aged 15. And in each instance, those kids had left El Salvador without a parent or a legal guardian and traveled to the U.S. on their own, um, trying to reunite with family members who were already here in the U.S. Uh, And they entered this country as unaccompanied minors is the the technical term. Mm -hmm. Um, So they, they weren't fleeing war in El Salvador, but they were fleeing violence. It was gang related violence that in, in um, had taken over, um, the parts of El Salvador that they were from. So the, the kids were in the room for, for a variety of reasons, but a majority of them had seen conflict or violence or war at, at a level that that is even greater than anything we've seen in this country in recent times. I can't imagine, even as an adult, making a trip from El Salvador to the U.S. and having a kid do that, it just it just is astounding. Yeah, and what really struck me was when I interviewed one of those students, um, uh, She, the teacher at a certain point asked the kids to pick one word to describe their journey to the U.S., and there's a great variety of words chosen. She chose the word bonita in Spanish, which means beautiful. And I was just really struck by the fact that, uh, you know, we in the United States might look at her story and think, that it's only a story of hardship or she has experienced only such difficulty, but she herself did not see her story that way. She Mm -hmm. thought it was an extraordinary thing to get to travel to the U S and sit on this bus 
that her uncle had put her on and get to look out the windows at this beautiful scenery. She thought it was, you know, a, one of the most interesting things that had ever happened to her in her life was getting to travel here. And so just her optimism and resilience, I thought, came through loud and clear in that choice of word describing her journey as beautiful. And I, I was really impressed by her strengths and um, optimism. Well, that, that is a beautiful story, <laughs> you know, you guys, to look yeah. at it from such a positive point of view. It's going to be amazing to see what that young lady does, you know. I agree. I agree. I can't wait to see what she does with her life. Yeah, had most of the students had some type of formal education prior, or most of them it was kind of a mixed bag? In a classroom like the one that I was in, which is a designated newcomer room, um, mm-hmm. the newcomer term is is uh, what schools often use for a classroom like this one. And the students in the room are not only new to English typically, but um, some may be new to school. So in some cases, you can have students in these classrooms that have not been in school before. That was not true for any of the kids that that were in Eddie Williams' classroom when when during the year that I was there, all of them had been in school at some point. All of them knew how to read and write in their home language at least, if not in multiple languages. There was even a young woman from Africa who spoke seven languages. Um, wow. So the kids in his room. They had missed school for a number of years, either because in the case of the two sisters from Iraq that I wrote about, they were taken out of school when Damascus became so unsafe, when they were living in Syria and the Civil War happened and there were so many car bombings, it was so unsafe outside that the majority of parents in their neighborhood stopped sending their kids to school. And then the two boys from the Congo, the two brothers that I wrote about in the book as well, they um, one of them, the older brother, was taken out of school by his parents when they needed help just growing food and collecting firewood just so they could feed their family. So for, for a variety of reasons, many of the students had missed some years of school, but they'd all had schooling at some point in time and all showed up um, actually knowing our alphabet in addition to whatever alphabet they used they were more used to writing in. So they, they had learned um, at least how to write in, in the Latin script that we use. Uh, so that was a level of proficiency that you don't always see. Um, sometimes in, an, in a newcomer classroom, you can have kids that, are, um, that need a lot more support just to become literate. Uh, the, the kids in the room, the year that I spent at South, I could see that many of them were going to be able to go to college. And in fact, at the high school itself, um, there were other students I met who were three or four years ahead of the newcomers that I was concentrating on and writing most about. Um, But their older peers at the school who'd been newcomers in earlier years were themselves applying to college, you know, and, and then I watched them go to college. So I could see that this school this high school um, was able to take newly arrived refugee teenagers from coming, showing up, lacking basic English, getting them oriented in English, proficient in English, and ultimately even college ready. Uh, so that that was pretty cool to see. That was extraordinary. I thought it sounds like that they have that really well, you know very well figured out. So the students have the best opportunity to get into college and do whatever it is that they want to do. Yeah. Yeah, and the school also has paraprofessionals working there who themselves once arrived as refugees and have nonetheless managed to get both a high school degree and then also put themselves through community college, maybe get a bachelor's degree. And so there are grown-ups in the school as well, working there on staff, who have both a refugee background and yet a college degree at the same time. And I think, you know, they serve as role models and examples to the students of what's possible. 
you know, that they can do it themselves. You know, mm-hmm. when when you were there, did you ever see like any cultural issues or conflicts within the students? Um, yes. The the one that um, uh, leaps to mind when you ask that question is um, this high school has what they call Culture Fest. It's a big celebration of international culture that happens once a year. All kinds of kids from all sorts of backgrounds put on um, uh, clothing from their home countries and, and sing songs in their home languages. And it's really quite an amazing thing to see. Um, and uh, there were some students from Eritrea who were teamed up and supposed to work with some students from Ethiopia. And those two countries share a contested border and have had many conflicts. Um, and then at South, the Eritrean students and the Ethiopian students fell into arguing and were, were not able to work together kind of just as you see in their home countries, the mm-hmm. neighboring countries, even though they share common languages, they um, have this contested history. And so they kind of mirrored the conflict from, from their home country. But that was not typical. I mean, in general, the kids got along um, a astonishingly well and were really curious about each other's backgrounds and, you know, supportive of each other. So, uh, you know, I remember seeing their teacher, Eddie Williams, go and find a mentor for every newcomer student in his room. And he found an older student elsewhere in the high school who was both, um, generally speaking, from you know, the student's home country knew their home language and yet had become fluent in English themselves. Um, in one or two cases, he couldn't find somebody from the newcomer student's home country, but he found somebody from a, a country where they spoke the same language. So, like, there was a girl in the newcomer room from Tajikistan, and there were no Tajik students at South that particular year, but the teacher was able to find a student from Russia who spoke Russian and the Tajik student in his room, in the newcomer room, knew Russian. And so they were able to communicate. Um, But but generally he found somebody from their home country who knew their home language. Um, Even when the languages were, you know, what a general person might consider obscure, like Mm -hmm. the students whose families were from Burma, one student spoke Karen, another spoke Kareni. These were languages I had never heard of before I started spending time with refugee families, um, but their teacher found students who spoke those languages and connected those students with mentors who could help them um, answer any questions they had, kind of explain the high school, how things worked. Uh, and the students, I think, were incredibly grateful to have that kind of peer support in their home languages it meant a lot to them. Yeah. I can imagine. I mean, being able to communicate is such a big deal, you know, and and to have somebody to talk to, even if it's, you know, for a short period of time as you're learning another language makes such a big difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Loneliness and isolation were the two big issues that newcomers faced at the outset. And all these things their teacher did and the school did to help combat that and to help kind of stitch them together into the feeling part of the rest of the high school um, mm-hmm. uh, went a long way to alleviating those things and, and helping them make connections, find friends, and feel more part of a community. Yeah. What, what I mean, this would probably be a, a difficult question to answer, but was there one student that really kind of stood out to you? Um. I was very much struck by Methuselah. Um, He was the younger brother from the Congo. There were two boys from that family in the room. He was the younger one. But his older brother, Solomon, had been taken out of school to help with chores. And so Methuselah was the kid in that family who'd been able to go to school continuously. And you could tell, you know, he and Solomon were, were both intelligent, but Methuselah, because he'd been in school continuously, was ahead of his older brother in his Mm -hmm. studies. And Methuselah just possessed a fairly awesome 
really prodigious uh, <laughs> sense of ambition and drive um, mm-hmm. as well. Uh, out of all the students in the room, he struck me as possibly the most ambitious or the most driven. And the reason I, I thought that was, Early in his time in the room, he would stand up, carry his notebook, bring bring it over to me, and just put it down in front of me wordlessly. And um, <laughs> uh, I understood that he was looking for somebody to correct his work. And, you know, I was a journalist visiting the room, and I had explained that to him by this point in time. So he knew that, but he nonetheless had figured out that I was an underutilized resource you know, and you know that he I would help him uh, with mm-hmm. his with his English if he asked and that began um, a whole you know parade of kids followed suit and and once they saw what he was doing they came over and did the same thing too and I fell into correcting all their sentences and I, I write about all this in the book but it was Methuselah who had the initiative to, to see that and recognize it. So he he, he really stood out for me um, as as somebody I, I feel will go far in life. Uh, He's already I delegating. Actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was actually back at South High School this week because huh? the school itself um, and the school district wanted to hold a, a press conference. The students at South organized the press conference and um, with me and, and uh, about the book and, and with their teacher, Eddie Williams. So we all met in the library and it was the student Senate at South that was, was running this. But Methuselah by this point had joined the student Senate and he was participating in the press conference. And just to hear him articulate in now, you know, almost flawless English, uh, what it what it had been like for him in the 2015-2016 school year to have me in the room and have me come say, would it be okay to write a book about you? It was really moving for me. And, and um, he, he, what he said was when I first asked him if I could write a book about him, he didn't understand why I would want to do that. He, his thought was, why would anybody want to write about me? Uh, but over time and sort of getting to understand the project and then when I gave him a copy of the book and he saw his story there, he he felt really proud that he was included in this book and he, I think, liked the way that I was writing about him. Um, I just loved being back at the school and being reunited with the kids because I became so fond of them over the course of the school year and I just loved seeing them now, two years later, so much more articulate, so much more poised, you know, holding a press conference that they themselves had organized. And instead of me asking them questions, they had turned the tables and they were asking me questions at this press conference. Um, so I, I, it, they're going to go far. Uh, oh, without a doubt. They're going to do, yeah, they're going to do extraordinary things. It, it probably really makes them feel like their story has a voice, even if they didn't realize it when you were writing the yeah. book, you know, but yeah. now two years later, the book is out and it's doing tremendously well. And, and they're looking at this going, gosh, you know, my story is making an impact for other newcomers and for people to understand exactly. what it's like to be a newcomer. Exactly. And and for people to understand that there's something that there's something universal in that experience. We've all mm-hmm. been in that kind of predicament where we feel so lonely and cut off and we don't know how to communicate successfully. And the newcomer experience is like that to the nth degree. But when 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 it's unpacked emotionally and you understand what's at the heart of the experience, it's something we can all identify with and relate to. Mm-hmm. Well, and. I understand that you also visited the Congo as well as part of the research that you did for the book. Yeah, and um, that came about for a couple reasons. One was, as I spent time with the Congolese family, Methuselah's family, Mm -hmm. I gradually became aware that they did not love talking about difficulty. And in fact, there was a cultural bias toward celebrating blessings 
but not discussing your problems or your troubles. And so my attempts to interview his parents about why they had left the Congo were sort of only partially successful and to really understand why they left or what was so hard about the Congo, I felt it was important to travel there. And um, it just so happened that I, as I was asking, you know, others who've traveled a lot to Africa for advice, I came across the fact that somebody that I knew was organizing a trip for instructors from the Air Force Academy to go to the Democratic Republic of Congo. So the Air Force Academy is here in Colorado where I live, and I was able to tr jump on that trip and travel with U.S. military personnel. And that uh, made me feel much more comfortable about going because I was traveling to a part of the Congo that does have a lot of conflict where there are active militia groups and where the United Nations has its largest peacekeeping mission, meaning tens of thousands of U.N. soldiers are there trying to um, – stop the lawlessness and the violence that is endemic in that region. I would have not felt, I would not have felt comfortable going on my own and uh, to, to, to happen upon, you know, the fact that the air force instructors were going felt, I felt so fortunate to be able to go with them. And once we were there, the air force instructors, because they are military, were able to make connections with the military um, personnel working for the UN that I don't think I could have achieved as a journalist. And so I was included in some meetings and some conversations that where I learned a lot more than I think I would have on my own also. So I was really grateful to those two Air Force instructors for letting me tag along and sharing their, their research with me. Um, when we were meeting with the UN personnel, they were going over with us, the militia groups, on the eastern side of the Congo, who's active and what they're doing to try to combat mm -hmm. um, the activities of those militia groups. And it was just very eye-opening and very illuminating for me to get that perspective on uh, what was happening there. And I could, I could then understand much better why Methuselah's parents had, had fled from that part of the Congo with all of their kids and walked for many months until they reached a, a refugee settlement in Uganda. Uh, so, so by going to the Congo, I think I was then able to describe the family's journey and, and show a reader in the United States what it was that that family was, was fleeing from. I think it's a more complete story to it. And obviously you're the right person to be writing this book because it sounds like that trip to the Congo just kind of you know, in in some ways kind of like miraculously happened, you know? It was an amazing thing. Yeah. It, I, and I, when I was chatting with the person who was organizing the trip, I was just saying, do you, I know you traveled Africa a lot. Do you have, a, do you have any contacts in the Congolese community? I'm trying to understand this family better and what they lived through. And he said, well, we're going to Goma next, you know, in two weeks. Why don't you come with us? And I had to scramble to get like the shots and the visa and everything. Um, and I wasn't In sure. In two weeks, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a big scramble. I, I ran and got a yellow fever vaccination. I think that same day. So. Mm -hmm. it's, Get everything in order so you can be ready to go on that trip. And, and you yeah. know, Congo is going through such upheaval to be able to do that trip with the military and then being able yeah. to be connected really allowed you to get a, a viewpoint that I don't think many people get. Right. That's right. And um, on that same trip, we were also successful in – visiting the refugee settlement that Solomon and Methuselah had lived inside uh, when they were seeking refuge in Uganda. And to, to get to visit their refugee settlement in particular also added what life is like inside uh, a refugee settlement. And the, the main thing that I took away from that visit was, you know, uh, of, of course I could see that the kind of house they had lived in was much more humble and 
didn't have any of the amenities, you know, that a home would have uh, that they were living in in the U.S. So, you know, their their home there had no heat and no electricity and no running water, and you know, none of those and, things. Yeah. Right, but but even more importantly, and I think what I really took away was education was extremely limited inside the settlement. So there were schools, there were government-run schools, but in general, families were taking their kids out. The majority of parents were taking the majority of kids out sometime during the elementary school years because the families needed help growing food, um, raising crops, and collecting firewood and, and getting water just to survive, just to have enough to eat. Um, so very few children were making it through high school in, inside the settlement. And that's what resettling provided this family. It gave them an opportunity for their kids to get a high school degree, maybe go to college, have an, a, a whole different kind of life and a whole different ability to assimilate um, into, uh, into American society in this case um, because – they were going to have a shot at a real education. Being able to really move forward in life. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, Helen, I can talk to you for hours on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's, your book is, is, is such an inspiration, and I highly recommend that people go out and purchase their copy of The Newcomers. You know, where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community? I'm really active on Twitter, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. And if you follow me on any of those social media platforms, you'll get all the latest news. Um, and my website has links to social media, and my website is just my name, HelenThorpe.com. Thorpe has an E on the end. Um, yeah, follow me on Twitter, and you'll, you'll, you'll hear all the, all the updates. All the news and updates. Well, I'm following you on all of your social media. I highly suggest everyone does the same. You know, Helen, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Helen. It's been enlightening to spend this time with you, to hear about your journeys, and also your book, of course, The Newcomers. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guests and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.